Before we get started, Matt wanted to apologize for his sniffles. The allergies are great up here in Maine, and he can't help it. Now on with the show. Good morning, guys. Welcome to Quinn's Tree Farm. Coming to you straight through the power of YouTube, right from Cornville, Maine. It's going to be a hot one today, so being the dedicated, devoted worker that I am, I'm filming, <laughs> I'm filming footage while it's still a little bit cool. And then I'm going to go inside and edit it during the hot because that's how I roll. Uh, one of the upsides to being a Christmas tree farmer is sometimes things don't need to get done on such a timely schedule that a day here or there is going to uh, mess things up. I wanted to do a couple of field updates. Uh, we had a, a very nice class uh, this weekend, last Friday, the 14th of June, uh, and we had the UMaine Extension Office come. Uh, my friend Brett Johnson, who works with them, he's a uh, assistant professor for the extension, and he's the Christmas tree guru for UMaine Extension. Set this whole thing up where uh, we had a uh, pesticide credit class. So we ended up having Brett ended up getting a couple of his coworkers uh, who were. Uh, experts in pesticide control and uh, plant diseases and things like that uh, to come out and do a class on integrated pest management and some other diseases in the field. And there was 20 of us that showed up uh, and went through the field and, and my fields got uh, looked over with a, a microscope and the biggest takeaway that I think everybody got from it was uh, they're not the only ones that have problems and when you have uh, 10,000 to 12, 15, 20, 30,000 trees. Some of them aren't going to make it and some of them aren't going to be healthy and there's uh, things you can do about it, but at the end of the day are there things you should do about it. And that's where integrated pest management really comes into play is uh, the uh, cost benefit uh, economic threshold is, as Brett would say, where at what point am I spending too much money to not reap the benefits. And in particular, I have a field, uh, well, I, I have a field, but I have trees, uh, we're gonna go over it here in a bit, that suffer from root rot, Phytophthora root rot. And you can spray trees for Phytophthora root rot. Uh, there are fungicides that, that will take care of it. Uh, it's not easy. It's not like, hey, take care of it. You know, I mean, it's, it's uh, they'll take care of it, but it, it's you got to work at it apply and, and things like that and it's expensive and uh, you have to apply it right in the uh, same time frame as you're planting Christmas trees for a spring season so the question is do I spray uh, this fungicide trying to get rid of these fungals or do I get 3,000 5,000 trees in and this year I made the decision to get 3,000 to 5,000 trees in so the biggest takeaway is I wanted to show you uh, my one of my tree mentors, uh, who's a little bit uh, younger than me in age, but years older than me in growing. Uh, Matt, uh, you know you're gonna you're gonna watch this later, but uh, my my good tree mentor Matt Lacase uh, showed me uh, a way to to find Phytophthora root rot without having to send a sample into the state and spend money. So I wanted to go over that. I wanted to show you that quickly. I wanted to bounce around to a couple of the other fields, show you what uh, the uh, benefits uh, to our mowing and uh, spraying regimen uh, and how that looks. And uh, yeah, we'll go from there. So stick around and let's get to work. Okay. So this poor guy is checking out and it's pretty clear uh, from what Matt has showed me in my research that that tree got a little bit of Phytophthora last year and it's not going to make it. And what he was telling me is uh, the first is you can see how that's dead from the bottom up. So he said uh, the root rot goes from the bottom up. So you, I, it doesn't get any more clearer than that. It goes all the way around. So big rig right around the bottom. Typically he, 
you, you know, if it was a, uh, if it was a mechanical thing where the mower hit a branch and that died, that's a little bit different than a whole ring around the bottom. The second thing that he said to look for, and he took his fingernail because he's a tough guy, but I'm not going to do that, is to scrape the bark on the base of the tree. And if it looks like it's chocolate, uh, that's bad. So let's do that. So I got my knife and he said just scrape a little bit right here. Oh yeah. And he said, see that? See how that's brown in there? He said, that's bad. The other thing that you can see there is see all this white stuff? Let me get right up in there. So see, see that where I scraped, it's all brown and chocolate. And then see all that white stuff around it? Well, that's pitch. And that's the other telltale sign. Root rot will leave these pitch uh, dripping down the side of, of the tree. So let's go look at it. I'll go look at a healthier tree and we'll see what the bark looks like on a healthy tree. So you see, no real trouble here. All green, all good, right? Okay. And it, the trunk looks healthy. There's no pitch, there's no nothing there. So otherwise, this should be nice and green. Oh yeah, you can see it as soon as I cut. See the difference? So if you have a dead tree that looks like that, uh, with the pitch and the things on the bottom, rest assured that there's a good chance it's gonna be a Phytophthora root rot. So that tree's gonna end up being a Halloween tree, just like the others. Uh, luckily they're hit or miss over here. I want to talk about some needle cast fungus that I have in my farm. Uh, both the root rot and the needle cast are secondary to the uh, terrible uh, rains that we had last year. Uh, and I'm afraid that this year the, uh, the needle cast fungus is going to be worse because typically, from what I've been told, needle cast fungus is a year out and a, a year out. So like all the rain last year got the problem going and this year we'll, we'll see it. So, needle cast fungal, fungus. So see these re dead red orangey needles? That's a needle cast fungus. It's either Lyrula or Rhizophora. And what you can do is look at the underside of the needle and see how some of them have a line going right up the middle of them. The distinctive dark lines indicate Lyrilla. Rhizosphera appears to present as spots. At least according to the book, I have never seen it in person. I got a little tongue-tied when I filmed this. How do you like my AI voice? Most people aren't going to notice them uh, on a Christmas tree. They're not harmful to humans, or it's not something that's going to once they're gone, you know, it's not like it's going to cause an endemic across the world uh, by shipping them out. So we'll get rid of them. Uh, in June update of the transplant beds. Looking pretty spiffy if you ask me. The Koreans have finally broken bud. And then we got this one over here. So here's a good example. No pre-emergent sprayed in between the trees. Pre-emergent sprayed in between the trees. I am not going to touch that until the stalk hardens off sometime in August, early September. Uh, and then I'll spray that down. And then this one, I can either clip those in there or just let it go. That's growing slow enough. And uh, in all honesty, I could probably get in there uh, where it's so light and, and spray uh, another pre-emergent through there to kind of knock it down again. All right, let's go over to Moody's Field. Okay, here we are. We're over at Moody. And I wanted to show you, this was the, the field that we did the uh, pre and post-emergent uh, herbicide application in. Uh, so I wanted to show you 
Uh, this was about three weeks ago. I'll have to look at my book, but this was uh, a couple, three, four weeks ago, three weeks ago, and uh, show you what it looks like and why I like it. I came over and mowed the other day and it was really easy. And uh, yeah, so these are the MCTA balsam and bracted balsam uh, mix just because I I'm not good at laying out a nice grid. So there's Bracteds and MCTAs in here. You can kind of see the difference between the colors and the, and the uh, timing of the flush. The MCTAs would have been a much earlier flush. And these uh, Bracteds are a little bit later in the flush. Uh, these were planted last year, uh, 23. And these are the ones that got the 3020 bio pack in the fall. And I am pretty happy with the success uh, rate and how good these look after one year in the ground. If we're doing sleep, creep, leap, uh, then these are the creeping year. Uh, and next year will be leap year. But that's pretty impressive to me. I'm pretty happy with that. As you can see, we ended up doing that nice pre-emergent, post-emergent strip of a glypho uh, goal uh, mix and uh, keeps things nice and down. And then when we mow the fields, we can just go up and down the lines. This field we were a little late to the party with because uh, I didn't spray last fall. And you can see a difference, I'll show you, as we end this bank. You can kind of see a difference of, uh, you know, some of the, the taller grass that ended up getting put down. And going to the next field, uh, I sprayed this in preparation for this year, last late summer, early fall. Uh, and you can see the difference by knocking the weeds down last fall and to this year. And these are the trees that we planted this year. These were planted in... April uh, and they are a mix of Bracted, MCTA and late flush balsam. So these all came from Downies uh, and the others, all of the trees in this field have come from Downies. Uh, I get some Canaan's from Berkey's that are in other fields. Uh, maybe we'll stop on the way back and I can show you what one looks like. Please disregard the loopy uh, pattern of uh, rose here. I'm not sure what I was smoking or drinking, but I forgot to put a kill strip there and a kill strip here. So next year we'll uh, we'll fix those out, and then they just go down over the hill. I really think as I've been going through this journey, as I've been talking to different people. As I've been seeing with my own two eyes, the importance of site prep and picking the right site for these trees. So this uh, is Bangor soil. Mills is Thorndike. The main field is Bangor. And I have some other fields that are uh, Dixmont and Mornada. And if you're in Maine and you know anything about soil, when you say the words Mornada, you're thinking soaking wet and not good for fields. And that's one of the things that I've had. So at some point I'm gonna do a big video on the soil maps and soil testing. But until then, see how that ridge all ridges up? And maybe it's hard to see on video and there's nice, good, well-drained soil there and the trees are green. And then we come down here and we got a whole stack of dead, I say dead, but two dead, struggle, 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 popped out, frost heaved, struggle, dead, you know, green, not good. And if you look, this is a low spot and it's wet. Our trees like good, well-drained soil and it's wet. You could also tell the difference because you have different grasses. See those ferns? Where do ferns grow? Where do orchard grasses grow? In the wet. So one of the learning things that I've, I've really 
looked at is we either need to raise the trees out of that wet soil with raised rows or we need not plant there if we have other soil to plant. So in the future, I'm going to get better at site uh, evaluation and site preparation, which in turn will hopefully keep the Phytophthora away because the soil drains, it proliferates in water. So if we don't have any water and it's nice and dry and well drained, we'll have less Phytophthora issues. And we also will have less drowning issues. And yeah, the world will be lovely. So yeah, that's a quick update of uh, where we're at and what we do. And you can actually see the progress of the fields taking shape and the fruit of our labor, so to speak. Uh, if you like this sort of stuff, go ahead and subscribe to the channel, hit a like. And if there's anything that you have any questions about, uh, and, and, and want me to talk about, leave a comment down below or, uh, or send me an email, quinstreetfarm.com, uh, and uh, hopefully we can get it out to you. I don't pretend to know everything. Uh, I probably dare say I barely know anything when it comes to this stuff, but I'm willing to talk about it and I'm willing to learn with you guys. So uh, that's that. Even when it's really hot like this, uh, you know that I'd really rather feel bad in Maine than feel good anywhere else. So, there go, my friends. I'll see you soon.